the perfection of the individual in relationship with others, and of course the larger community that surrounds us, whether they're Christian or not. And so you see at the very end of this reading, he says that while we have time, because life is short, we think it may be long, and there may be some days in which we think they're longer than others, but ultimately we're only put on this earth for one purpose, to glorify God. That's the only reason why we exist, to glorify God, and within that glorifying of God, we find our healing and perfection of grace perfecting in nature. And so he talks about these relationships. But at the very end, he winds up saying that while we have time, let us do good. Because he's answering the question, stop bickering over legal directives. The law of Moses is not going to save you. Only grace will save you. So while we have time, let us do good to all, but especially to those who are members of the household of Christ. In other words, those who have an intimate relationship with us, those who have, as Christians, those who are in connection with us. And so you have at the beginning of this epistle today, he talks about correcting our neighbor. This is called fraternal correction. Fraternal correction is among equals. For a parent to correct their children, that's an obligation in justice. That's not an act of charity. You have an obligation to educate your children. You have an obligation to give them discipline. You have an obligation to set their feet on the path of the gospel. That's an obligation. That's not fraternal correction. That's an obligation. And there are on occasions in which we have to correct our superiors. But that is also something different. It's not fraternal correction. St. Paul, in the same letter to the Galatians, talks about him dealing with St. Peter. And St. Peter is clearly above him, if you like, in the hierarchy. But Peter had gotten cold feet when he was living in Antioch. And up until that time, he just saw the Gentile converts as being equal to everybody else. Everyone's a Christian. Everyone's a member of the one body of Christ. They're not all equal in the sense they all have the same talents and qualities and everything else. Of course not. But they are all functioning members of the one body of Christ. And Peter, until, until being in Antioch, he had always just eaten and treated with the Gentiles as he did with any other Christian. But in Antioch, there was pressure put on him by the Judaizers. Because you can't eat with pagans. It's contaminating, it's polluting. Remember in our Lord's Passion, the Pharisees do not go into the Antonia. Pontius Pilate is obliged to go out and talk to them because they won't go into the pagan household because it will pollute them according to the law. And this pressure put on Peter was he stopped eating with the Gentile Christians. And when Paul heard of this, he was completely flabbergasted. You can't do this. You are scandalizing. You're giving a bad example. These people are the same Christians all around. And he says, I confronted Peter on this. But it's a very unique thing. And so fraternal correction is among equals. Your colleagues, fellow students, workers, whatever it may be. And in correcting one, St. Paul says, it's to accomplish the good. It's an important point. By nature, we lash out. By nature, we criticize. By nature, we try to make everyone else perfect while we just keep slogging along doing whatever we do. And of course, that's unfair, and it makes each other mad. Normally, that's quite natural. But St. Paul is again reminding us in this section, the purpose of what we're doing is good. My purpose is not to point out someone's faults. My, my, my purpose of pointing it out is to help them in the virtue that that fault has contradicted. That's a totally different thing. This is part of sharing the burden with one another. It would be the difference between a, a teacher who just simply humiliated a student because they got a D on their test, just ridiculed them because of the D, made sure everyone in the class knew they had a D. 
as opposed to the individual teacher who would ask that student perhaps to stay after class. There's something punitive in it. But the purpose is, is to sit them down and say, how can we correct what you did on this exam? That's different. Our natural tendency is just simply to lash out that murmuring and complaining and arguing that we had in last week's epistle to the Philippians. Because doubtless we go through life and there are all kinds of things we don't like. Things that we would do differently. That's inevitable. But St. Paul is reminding us, how do we respond to that? Do we just grit our teeth and become angry? Or do we actually look as a way to accomplish and to draw out of this cross the grace and the goodness of what ultimately is the resurrection? Every contradiction, every disappointment, every misunderstanding for a Christian is an occasion of goodness. Even if it comes down to the just simply being able in silence to receive the cross, because I can't fix it. It's not something I can do. This is a very important point. Because while St. Paul is dealing with the Galatians, they're all focused upon concrete things, directives, laws, do this, don't do that. And while those things had benefit in the Old Testament, if you fixate on them and make them your primary concern, they're no longer of importance. On a natural level, if you wind up lashing out at people just because things are not the way you want them to be, then that's just purely nature. That's just a voicing of resentment. But what St. Paul says that in correcting our neighbor, we help them accomplish good. Our Lord uses it when he says in the gospel, then you have gained your brother. He's your teammate. He's with you. You've gained your brother. That is the sharing of the burden of one another. And he says that is the fulfillment of the law of Christ if you want law. It's his charity. And so St. Thomas talks about the accomplishment of fraternal correction. Because it's not just something that we may or may not do. It's something we are obliged to do by charity. On a supernatural level, it would be going back to that example on the natural level of the teacher... If you just watch the student floundering in the D and then there's an F and then there's a C and then we're back to a D again and then there's another F. If you just watch that student floundering and didn't extend any help to them, you're not a good teacher. And if you watch your neighbor flounder in sin, you're not a good brother. You're not a good sister. I mean, God forbid that we should condone evil which is what we do in the modern world. We think it's okay. This cousin is living in her third domestic arrangement or whatever, and we condone it. Condone it in the sense that we act like it's normal. And those things are not correct. It doesn't mean we have to hound them, telling them they're always wrong. But we have to voice, especially in the beginning when these things take place, how many conversations I've had on the questions of marriages? Oh, for heaven's sakes. Because so-and-so has a cousin, or so-and-so has a sister, or so-and-so has a brother, or so-and-so has a child, who in choosing to do their domestic arrangement is not actually getting married in the body of Christ. It's a destination wedding. They found a really nice beach in Acapulco. Great. That has nothing to do with the consecrated members of Christ. And therefore the church has always judged that it's invalid. It's not a marriage. The consecrated member of Christ has to be joined in matrimony in the form of the Christian body, which is Christ. So what do you do? Ah, the pain, the tears, the agony. It's not valid. You're going to go to something that is objectively a profession of public announcement of our adultery or of our fornication. Well, that makes it even worse. So what do we do? What are the principles of the faith that are involved? Ultimately, it's a, a member of the body of Christ who's announcing a relationship which is meant to be a divine mystery. Can you or can you not go? 
What are the principles of the faith? That application is what St. Paul is talking about here, to accomplish the good. I go to that cousin's wedding and act like everything's normal, bring them a gift, do all these things. I'm condoning that sin. And St. Paul says it's not only sufficient, it's not sufficient that we do not commit evil, but we must not also acquiesce or condone evil. It's a letter to the Romans, I believe. This is the question of accomplishing the good. So when we go in fraternal correction, first of all, it's not a lashing out. It's not vindictive. There's no reason for us, which means immediately if we're functioning in that mindset of grace, we are not harsh. We are determined, and we will repeat the same thing that we need to repeat. But it's not harsh. It's not humiliating. It's not pejoratizing. But it is correcting, and it's an obligation that we have to do. I must tell that cousin, I cannot come to your wedding, and here's why. They will scream, they will work among the family to make sure they all know what a jerk you are within the family, etc. You know human nature. But the principles and the law of Christ is to share that burden. And we must ask as Christians at every moment of our lives, in season and out of season, when it's convenient and when it's not convenient. And God only knows in the modern world, it is mostly not convenient to live as a Catholic vis-a-vis -vis the pagan population around us. Doesn't matter. We have to do that. So St. Thomas will say that we must do this fraternal correction out of the act of charity. And our Lord says the same thing in the Gospel. If we don't know whether this person will respond well or not, we still have to say something, do something. Again, discretionary, behind the scenes, quiet, privately. The only time when we are exempted from exercising fraternal correction is when we know the individual and we know the situation that it will be an explosion and a grounding of, more importantly, a grounding of the individual in that evil. They're going to do it now because you said something about it. We know those instances too. And at that point, St. Thomas says, well, then you don't do anything in that instance because you're not actually accomplishing any good. The other one, the neutrality, the possibility of doing good, you have to do something. When you know they're actually of good disposition, but they're just ignorant and don't really know what they're doing because they were badly catechized, God help us, that is so much of the Catholic population as it is, that makes us even more gentle to understanding they're doing this in ignorance, but all the more reason why we have to say something. Because we're instructing the ignorant. And that's one of the, that is one of the works of mercy spiritual works, but one of the works of mercy that we are obliged to accomplish. So there's a lot in this chapter 6 of the letter to the Galatians. But St. Paul, that's why he says, to those of you who understand, those of you who are living fully the gospel, and the term he uses in the, in the epistle is, those of you who are spiritual, you are mature in the gospel, you have to correct them, but be careful of yourself, because we are all the same weak human beings. And he says, remember yourself, remember your weakness, lest you also be tempted. Now that temptation doesn't mean you're going to do the same thing that they did, or are planning to do, but that you're going to be tempted in some way, which may be in the immediate circumstances, which is just vengeance. I never liked this cousin anyway, so I'm actually quite happy to tell her I'm not going to her wedding. I'll make it look religious, but really it's an act of vengeance. And he's saying, be careful. It has to be done for the purpose of charity. So if you understand that, then you understand why this section begins about that and then finishes by talking about while we have time, let us do good. This is the law of Christ to accomplish what it is of grace in this world. It doesn't change nature, but it does change and perfects relationships because it perfects them. And then the overarching of the whole thing, we see in the middle of it, 
where he talks about those who, who have received instruction, those who have been catechized, those who have been taught. He reminds us we have a responsibility to support the one who instructs us in all things. Now it seems out of place why he throws this in here in the middle. Because you're thinking, well, we're talking about doing good, we're talking about sharing one another's burdens, moving towards the vision of the good, and being inspired by the grace of God to do what is supernatural and good. That is the law of Christ. And then in the middle we have, you're catechized. But the catechization, the teaching and the instruction is the overarching framework, if you like, in which each generation learns to follow this law of Christ. And so that the catechist becomes central in every generation to what is taking place because it's informing them on the law of Christ. It's not degrading people into the distractions about the law of Moses or being taken off to these aspects of pagan observances. But it is elevating and inspiring. Read the anaphora of St. John Maron. Again and again and again, it talks about the illumination that takes place, the light in darkness. And of course, what we see again and again and again in our anaphoras is we make reference to the teachers who have gone before us, not professional teachers, but the catechists, the people in each generation who have stepped forward to instruct the next generation or the converts of this generation. That we pray for our fathers, our mothers, our brothers, our sisters, that family relationship, our teachers. You see it again so many times. This is the great importance, the overarching. So when you put all this together today, what is the law of Christ? It is love, but not love in the emotional sense. Emotions may be there, they may not be there. But love in the sense of the supernatural charity that is given to us by grace. And when we follow that, St. Paul says, then we share one another's burdens. We help one another. And we also know that each one of us carry our own burden that we will have to answer for. And that's why he says, therefore we can boast in what we have done, what I have done individually. And then he adds, and not in comparison to someone else. Because so often when we judge ourselves of our virtue, our morality, we're usually looking at some disoriented deadbeat somewhere in our family or someone we know at work. It's like, well, I'm not shacked up for the third time domestically, so I'm actually doing all right. And you're like, you're missing the point. St. Paul says, so he uses burden twice in this epistle. One, that we have to share and aid each other in moving forward, encouraging, supporting, this is why we have parish. We're supporting one another, aiding one another towards the good, towards the supernatural vision that in theory we all have by our faith and our baptism. But he says, lest you also be tempted, be careful. And within this, we each carry our own burden that we also have to pursue in our own life what is good, what is supernatural, and what needs to be done in our lives. And last week I mentioned, I think at 11 o'clock, or one of the sermons this week, and I'll leave you with this, is the St. Teresa of Avila, we commemorated last Saturday on the 15th. Teresa of Avila in her life became a great mystic reformer of the Carmelites, I mean an absolutely tremendous woman. If you do not know her biography, you must read it. Because she is an extraordinarily powerful woman. Strength is just her main attribute of which all of these virtues come forward. But early in her life, she had made a vow. The vow is a promise we make to God to consecrate something for God's service. It could be anything. Anything that's not sinful, of course. But Teresa of Avila in her life, under the direction of her spiritual father, made a vow that in every choice she makes, to always choose the better choice. So every time an option came up in life, she made a vow as a service to God to always choose the better thing in this option to do now. Not a huge thing, she's already religious and that, but every single decision, that's crucifying. 
It stands out as an extraordinary thing, something fairly unique also. But to live in such a way that my desire is always to do that which is more perfect, that is the path of what St. Paul is talking about in charity and grace in this sixth chapter of the letter to the Galatians. So by all means, my friends, read the whole epistle this week, meditate on it, and then understand even more profoundly this burden that we all carry individually and together. And may the God of goodness and consolation give us strength and fraternity, sorority if you want, we have to always be equal. So the fraternity that belongs, the brotherhood, the sisterhood, the one reality of the household of God that St. Paul talks about, that we ourselves may also, as a parish of St. Joseph's, become a shining light in our desire to do that which is good. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Almighty Lord in God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the blessed mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the chosen one, our holy father, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, and Saint Ignatius, the patriarch of Constantinople. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Continue with the anaphora of St. Mark, the Evangelist, on page 835. 835. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, Almighty Father, you are true and holy love. May we be bound by your divine love and find joy in it all the days of our lives. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with a holy kiss, that through Jesus Christ our Lord we may be your radiant and blameless flock. We glorify and honor you, your only Son and your only Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace. To the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. Peace. Oops, sorry. that you grant us in your mercy the riches of your grace and kindness. May your compassion and assistance sustain us all the days of our...
the all days of our lives through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people. We glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Holy God and Father, you sent your only Son to save us, for we are weak and poor. When we had gone astray, he brought us back to your spiritual fold by his royal blood. Through your grace and the favor of your only Son, we implore you to accept this bloodless sacrifice from our sinful hands, and through it to forgive our sins. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. Truly glory, thanks, praise, and honor are yours, O God, the Father, maker of all creation. With the own, your only begotten Son, and your living Holy Spirit, the angels, archangels, and all the heavenly hosts bless and praise you. They cry out and they proclaim. Holy, holy, holy are you, God, the Father, Almighty, your only Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we have strength. You sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. And by his saving passion, he restored us to our original inheritance and gave us life by his divine blood. Until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and 
Lord Jesus Christ, we remember your plan of salvation for us, your conception, birth and baptism, your saving passion, and life-giving death, your burial, your glorious resurrection and ascension into heaven, your sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and your royal second coming when you will judge all people and reward them according to their deeds. Now we ask you, at that fearful hour, have compassion on us and have mercy upon us in your kindness and forgive all our sins in your mercy. For this your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, As we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you. To the mercy of the Lord, as we send us your Holy Spirit, as we thank you. We appear in the form of a dove over your own sinful children. We descended in tongues of fire and the Lord will pass us in the upper room. May he perfect us as well with the abundance of your grace and make us chosen vessels for you. Annin Mario, Annin Mario, Annin Mario, Nite Moro Hayo Kodisho, Unahen the line of Alo Corbono, oh no. May these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the pardon of faults, the honor, upbuilding, and strengthening of your holy church and the protection of her children from all sin. And may these holy mysteries allow us to stand with confidence before your awesome throne, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, exalt your holy church established throughout the world, Protect your shepherds of the true faith in peace and security all the days of their lives, especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, the Shadow Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops, pious priests, pure deacons, and all who serve your holy altar. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, all those who call upon your holy name. Bless those who are near and bring back those who are far. Visit the sick and strengthen the weak. Release captives and assist the oppressed. Bring back those who have strayed that they may live in your fear and reward those who have, who have brought offerings to your holy church. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders and all the children of your holy church. Grant them security and peace, and keep domestic and foreign conflicts far from them, so that they may live in tranquility. Protect them by the sign of your living and victorious cross. Rescue the persecuted and displaced of your flock, and be a refuge for strangers and a companion to travelers. Grant your eternal rewards to monks, those who live on mountain, to those who live solitary lives, <clears throat> and to hermits who live on mountaintops and in the caves of the earth. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, upon this altar and upon your heavenly altar, the holy and ever Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, and evangelists. John the Baptist, the forerunner, Stephen the archdeacon and first martyr, St. Joseph, St. Jude, and St. Ignatius, 
and all the saints. May we join their ranks and share in their joyful feast. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the faithful teachers who have gone to the rest in the true faith, especially Peter and Paul, Mark, Clement, Ignatius, Dionysius, Julius, and all those who endured suffering and persecution for the strengthening of your holy church. Remember also those who serve your holy altar and forgive their sins, that they may reach your joyful dwellings. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, all those who have left this world and have gone to you. Lead them to your joyful dwellings and blot out all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. But the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. divine service and have perfected it in your good pleasure by the grace of your only Son and by the descent of your Holy Spirit. Sanctify us now that we may be renewed as your spiritual children so that with pure hearts and enlightened souls we may call upon you, O glorious Father and lover of all people, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of thine is now. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation of soul and body, and crush our enemy, the evil one. Grant us your mercy, through Christ Jesus our Lord, for you are blessed and glorified with him and with your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo el-Kurchun. O Lord, look upon us, your inheritance who bow before you, and guide our steps on your right path. Make us worthy to share in this sacrifice and may it sanctify the souls and bodies of those who receive it through Christ Jesus our Lord. We glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. 
holy gives for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth. To Him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. God the Father, how can we, who are unworthy, thank you for your grace. For you have given us this divine gift and have made us worthy to share in the body and blood of your only begotten Son who saved us. Through him and with him glory and honor are due to you and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo el 
Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, you are worshipped and you are holy. Bless and forgive the priests who are the stewards of your people and your holy church. Forgive the servers of your divine mysteries and all the faithful who have shared in this sacrifice. Care for orphans, help widows, assist the poor and the distressed, satisfy the hungry, and protect all who call upon your holy name in every place. May your name be glorified with that of your Father and your Holy Spirit, who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishments and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. <coughs>